Hi everyone, it's Proteus Astrology and I'm, uh, I've got another video for you. My name's Kieran. Uh, just to remind you, um, I think it's important just to say that the way I do these videos is exploratory. I don't always know where they're going. There's a mixture of uh, astrology, literature, art, music, biography, psychology. I throw them all in the mix. Uh, and, in, and in this case, uh, I'm going to delve into the subject of Tion Fortune. And I haven't done her before, so that's very interesting. But first, I think, let's see what Jupiter is up to, because Jupiter's on the move. And definitely, if you are still recovering from the eclipses on the Scorpio-Taurus axis, then you're not alone. The energy has been very dark, turbulent, and possibly traumatic. It could have triggered deep-seated fears and insecurities. Um, most likely it did. We may feel the sting in the tail of that yet, you know, it's not over. But in November and December, we have got a surge of Sagittarian energy. This is pretty usual at this time of year, but this wave of galloping and arrow pointing is more turbocharged. It brings up the superabundant ideas of hope, optimism, visions of far-flung uh, places, uh, multi multiple cultures, higher learning, expanded potentials, and uh, that's what we need to seed right now. Uh, this is a good time to do it. And the return of hope is, uh, is, is great, and it would be fine if only Jupiter didn't get so carried away sometimes. Uh, so you may need to be held in place, and if you can learn to do that. Um, if you can con contain Jupiter, then there could be a powerful wind in your sails during this time. So let's have a look. Um, Venus entered Sagittarius on the 17th. That's fine. Uh, she loves a rollicking adventure there. Mercury joined on the 18th, giving us uh, an extra verbal zeal on the soapbox. But uh, I always say Mercury should never be underestimated there. It can pull off Herculean feats of communication. Jupiter is still in Pisces, uh, but on Sunday the 20th trined the Sun that's uh, wonderful and then it goes direct on the 23rd so plans and opportunities can flood back into view after being stalled or even hidden a day later there's a new moon in Sagittarius at one degree then the Sun and moon in Sagittarius trying Jupiter in Pisces and Jupiter is stationary so the force of that is magnified this is definitely the time for Sagittarians to establish uh, their intention for the coming year, but equally for anyone to look in uh, at their Sagittarian placements in their chart to see which house it resides in, and then to formulate a Sagittarian style uh, plan or goal uh, would be a great thing to do to channel this energy. And uh, you know, you could just start off with something simple like your diet and your health if that is easier. To top it all, Jupiter returns to the fire sign of Aries right on the December solstice, December 21st. This is powerful too. Make sure to do some kind of journey or pilgrimage on that day as that honors Jupiter as the Lord of journeying. And it will set the tone of truth seeking for the coming months. It's cardinal energy there. Uh, and that is boosted by any planet at that point, uh, as it is the world axis. So it starts a new cycle for the sun returning to the light and for Jupiter, as it won't be back again in Pisces until 2033. Jupiter stays in Aries, though, until May 16th, 2023, when it moves into Taurus. So all this Jupiter movement bodes very well for Jupiterian themes. Um, so we might ex uh, expect some benevolence or feel more generous, uh, more expanded, more uplifted. And especially if you can find a way to embed that into any kind of celebration. The new moon and the solstice uh, uh, is marked by this Jupiterian theme. And uh, to me, that's greatly significant. They're all crucial points in the celestial calendar and they can become hugely influential for you. So that's uh, an Olympian amount of zeal for law, religion, philosophy, uh, mental exploration, 
and it's all very welcome after the sun being in Scorpio which incidentally for Sagittarians occupies their 12th house and that's where a lot of dark transformations have occurred but that would apply to everyone I think uh, especially this past uh, eclipse season. A caveat to the, all this however the, would be that Mars is in Gemini and opposing any planets that you may have in Sagittarius and for Gemini Sun signs, Mars no doubt will cross your Sun at some point in the next few weeks if it hasn't already done so. Mars is retrograde, so it's pulling back on any initiatives and goals, and needing a recharge. It will you know, stick it in the battery charger again. The drive you have had before may encounter bumps on the road or take much, much longer to achieve and require more physical energy than you imagined. So you may be sleeping a lot more than you imagined. It may put the brakes on all this forward moving energy, all the fresh hope, and it may feel like you're swimming with clothes on. Uh, and the milieu, the environment is heavy or fraught with sudden conflicts. So caution is still necessary, as always, with new plans. Or at the very least, try to be ultra flexible if those plans go awry. There's also a baleful influence of the Mars square Neptune aspect that peaked on November 19th still creating uh, distortions uh, it's like it ties energy into impossible knots and then dissolves them but leaves us none the wiser so let's talk about marina abramovich that year she reenacts each of callas's tragic roles in which um, the the character either went mad or died it also includes, however, Callas's own death in her room in Paris in 1977. So Marina, born the 30th of November 1947, and Maria Callas, born the 3rd of December 1923, share the same sun sign. They both have the uh, sun conjunct Jupiter, ruler of Sagittarius. In the first decan of Sagittarius, also ruled by Jupiter, which magnified their impact on the world. They both have Venus at the same first degree of Capricorn, and they have a Mars placement at the anoretic 29 degree, just in different signs. They were both born in the early degrees of Sagittarius, so both, both female centaurs like Dion Fortune, and they have this powerful combination of Mars, Saturn and Pluto in their charts, which um, create turbulence uh, within them that needs expression. Kalas magnetized controversy towards her and faced it head on. Similarly, Abramovich has courted controversy and manages somehow to transform that fulminating energy into something she can manipulate or turn into art. Kalas famously lived for art, I mean, the famous aria from Tosca. And Abramovich would appear even to take any risk possible, even to die for art. So I just thought that was incredibly interesting, the parallels there. Where is Dion Fortune in all of this? Well, she had this Sagittarian archetype like um, Kalas. Uh, in, in Kalas's most iconic role, it was for a Druid Moon Priestess in Bellini's Norma. And the famous aria is Casta Diva, which means chaste moon goddess. This is a prayer for peace, uh, but which ends in a death by fire. Uh, Callas brought Norma alive with more intensity of feeling than almost any other soprano. Um, but I think if any role expresses what Dion Fortune as Vivian Le Fay Morgan was about, then it is this character of Norma, the Druid priestess. So this is the scenario. It's a backdrop to uh, this little investigation into a larger than life Sagittarian personality, that of Dion Fortune. She was born December 6th in 1890. Uh, she's not as well known as she could be considering she's regarded in occult circles as almost as highly as uh, Alistair Crowley. She has the status of being the most famous female occultist of the 20th century though. Fortune and Crowley knew each other and at least according to Kenneth Grant, who was uh, Crowley's secretary, 
talked enthusiastically of reviving the pagan attitude towards cosmic and elemental forces at Netherwood uh, in Hastings. But it, Israel Regardi said the two probably did not meet, yet Grant said that she came to visit with Lady Frida Harris, the co-creator of the Thoth Tarot. Crowley was 15 years older than Fortune and was considered dangerous at that time, but they both died within a year of each other, which is interesting. Fortune wrote dozens of books and retained her highly independent spirit, even while she was in any a group or order. She carved her own unorthodox path, as you would expect from uh, Uranus at 29 degrees. And um, her interpretations return, retain a highly personal and original slant. She did not write any books specifically on astrology, but it would be a given that she used deep understanding of astrology to underpin all her rituals and to activate the planetary archetypes. She is linked to the legends of Avalon as she lived for a part of her life in Glastonbury. I became aware of Dion Fortune through reading Psychic Self-Defense. Um, it is one of the most practical books on how to protect yourself from psychic harm. Ever more needed in these times, I think, when the mental health of the collective is highly unstable and the wobble is affecting almost everyone at, to the point of being rain-fielded. Some personal attacks can't be explained in any other way than curses or that are psychic in origin. For physical attacks, you need a spot of martial arts. For verbal attacks, a quick wit might uh, suffice, but psychic attacks are by their nature nebulous with a Neptune flavor and as such, hard to diagnose. Yet they still cause untold emotional and psychological damage, which is why they can easily be confused with mental health issues. This book uh, offers several tips in a very practical way, even down to using onions to ward off evil in the house if you don't have any garlic handy. The reason she wrote it was that she herself was a victim of hypnotic psychic attack. It's that Pluto-Neptune conjunction which we'll get to. She had a conflict with a female warden in a college who made inappropriate use of hypnosis, sapping away her etheric energy. There were hints of exploitation and fortune said it felt like a hole ripped in her aura. She only healed through months of serious occult work. When I look for an example of, you know, the Sagittarian sun speaking through the native, um, that zodiac sun sign, uh, phenomenon, I look to this comment in the book, uh, quote, uh, we all know that when caught off our guard, there comes a dark temptation from the depths of our lower selves, something atavistic stirs, and we think thoughts or even do deeds in which we would never have believed ourselves capable, end quote. Remember that Sagittarius is the centaur, half man, half horse, a hybrid and that that struggle between the human feelings and animal instincts, those atavistic urges, is felt very keenly in every Sagittarian. They feel the split between the physical and metaphysical uh, more than most. But there are also depictions of female centaurs, centauridis, um, although they did not figure much in the myths. So we can start to see fortune in this way, I think. This, uh, she's a hybrid. Uh, but very metaphysical. Uh, in one or two of the photos we have of her, she looks somewhat imposing, not so much a female centaur, but almost like a Valkyrie, whose specific function was to guide the souls of heroes to their death. One of her biographers, Janine Chapman, said that fortune was physically imposing, like a rock. Sagittarians are often athletes, performers, teachers, preachers, and even shamans, often with a restless, questing nature. Fortune was the sort to become a psychiatrist at an early age, unusual for a woman uh, in that era, but she was known for her wise counsel to her inner circle. Sagittarians in general are often seen with their head high in clouds of ideas, while their bodies operate on Earth awkwardly. They are not so good at following the right instructions or social conventions, so they don't always come across very well. Geraldine Beskin of the Atlantic's Bookshop said uh, of Fortune that she was a force of nature, happy only when leading the way for others, but 
heavily defined by whether for or against the ideas of philosophy. Fortune, I think, falls into this maverick category where the Uranus is at that 29th degree, just doing its thing. But she was gifted as a communicator. Uh, she had Mercury in Sagittarius, which compensates for its struggles there. And uh, all these books that she wrote uh, contain her voice, which is firm, but never shouts. So as for the astrobiographical details more, her actual name was Violet Mary Firth. She was born in Llandudno in North Wales, but the Firth family uh, were from Sheffield. So she was from Yorkshire, but with Welsh blood. They were involved in hydrotherapy and her mother was a Christian scientist. So already adept at using thought forms and spiritual healing. Her, her parents actually would attend her meditation groups there are very few existing photos of her, and on her death, the followers decided to destroy all her papers, probably to stop any scandal arising from her interest in paganism. If the time of 2.11 in, uh, in the morning is correct, then the moon is in the 12th house, so very hidden. So there was, there was no cult of personality to proliferate this, but this has kept up her mystique, I think, and uh, increased her fame. This has not stopped people seeking out the burial lo uh, location in Glastonbury. Her name is derived from the Latin motto Deus non fortune, uh, God not fortune or luck. While she radiated this practical wisdom, that of a Pallas Athene, uh, which for her is in Sagittarius conjunct her Mercury, that's at 24 degrees, uh, which is very apt since she wrote so much. Pallas is the strategist, the independent woman who has a way with the words. She said experience is a good teacher, even though her lessons are very expensive. It's not Jupiter that ranks as the final despoter of her chart, but it is Venus, which is also her chart ruler, as Libra is on the ascendant. Here it's best to view Vivian Le Fay, the character in her novels, as the mouthpiece for fortune and the mysterious, her who she claims as an adept um, of ageless beauty. She gives away many clues to her real life personality in these novels as this character, which made good reading for that purpose alone. With the Sagittarian sun sign, there's a lot of plain speaking about tricky subjects in her non-fiction work. Uh, the reason she's so valued today is that she could write about highly complex topics and make them easy to understand she brought higher knowledge down to earth. In the novels too, she revealed in practice what is theoretical only in books, such as the mystical Kabbalah. She could, however, be bombastic and did not tolerate mystification for its own sake, but advocated for revealing the secrets of the ages. This is another Sagittarian trait of the truth teller. This garnered her several enemies whose cover was blown by this resolute attitude. Furthermore, she did not indulge in the tricky rhetoric that Crowley, the Libra, is famous for. Uh, she just revealed her knowledge as, as if talking to you, in, uh, as, a, as a friend taking you into her confidence. His Mercury was in Scorpio, so it was more twisted with satire, and hers was in Sagittarius, which is more uplifted, yet to the point. Still, while reading her, she seemed coy and uh, could have said a lot more, especially about sex which she was very interested in, even though very prudish. But the hints, even at sex magic, uh, are, you, know, have, you have to look hard to find them. But they are there, they are still, they are hints. And you have to read through the lines of the novels carefully to uh, figure it out. But that's part of the appeal of this Sagittarian sun sign. You are getting the unvarnished truth, but with a, with a wise old owl nodding and winking at you. Their ability to connect all the strands of wisdom together into a synthesis is uh, remarkable. Their books are still in high demand, and for those who don't like tomes full of technical vocabulary, her novels can trigger the very altered states she utilized to see visions. Uh, this may have been intentional, it probably most definitely was. The reader can be subtly led into a trance quite easily through reading. 
she transitions from the concrete 3D reality into dream Im imagery and conscious thought forms on the astral and etheric levels as she does in the opening chapters of Moon Magic. She does this as a casually switching gears in a high speed car. She knew her stuff and this comes through in her work. The novels may not be regarded as having uh, literary qualities, although they're not bad in that respect. They're not without merit and in tone, I think, similar to some of the works of Iris Murdoch. What set her apart was that she claimed an inborn knowledge. She had inner intuition and heightened states of mind. She ad advocated that everyone should find their own inner, inner ascended masters. She didn't need any lodge to validate her level or to initiate her. Her south node was conjunct the sun. This points to the fact that she came into this in incarnation with prior experience of being a priestess of the old gods. The same degree as that of the great attractor. This gave her the impetus, I think, in 1919, very early on, to join what was then the remnants of the original Golden Dawn. Um, this was no longer the Golden Dawn of 20 years previously. This was in the early 1920s. So not the same lodge to which Crowley and W.B. Yeats had belonged, uh, Arthur and Macken and uh, Bram Stoker and many others. That one disbanded, but it was still being run by Moina Mathers, a Swiss-Irish artist and astrologer and the wife of McGregor Mathers, the founder. She was running the Alpha and Omega order, uh, and it used the same material drawn from Hermetic Mysteries as the Golden Dawn, so it was a continuation. Fortune's teacher was a man named Theodore Moriarty, who became the model for her character Dr. Taverner in her short stories. Moriarty was an officer in the English medical service based in India. This book is uh, full of energy vampires showing how they work, not just at the physical level. She expresses more of the female viewpoint in occult practices, but this is not necessarily pandering to the Wiccan VR goddesses culture that has sprung up by the commercialization of witchcraft for the selfie generation, who often learn their instant mix spells on Instagram and Twitter. She, however, advocates as much for the divine masculine to be restored, as in the Goatfoot God, as the divine feminine. Uh, she rated anima and animus as having equal importance, not that one should bash the other. In the Sea Priestess, she states plainly also that all women are Isis, in the highest sense, if they are aware of that, but that Fortune herself is the representative of the cult of the Black Isis, and a whole lot darker than people realise, having rule over death as well as birth, and similar to the worship of Kali in India. Isis reassembled her partner Osiris, including the missing genital part cut off by his brother Seth. The original temple for the Golden Dawn was, was attributed to Isis Urania, Isis of the depths of nature and Urania the muse of astronomy and astrology. Why the moon uh, is so important for Fortune was that her lot of spirit, her Daemon, if you will, was at 26 degrees of Cancer, ruled by the moon. So many promptings to make moves in her life come from the tidal shifts of lunar inspiration. Quote, I am that soundless, boundless, bitter sea. All tides are mine and answer unto me. Tides of the airs, tides of the inner earth. The secret, silent tides of death and birth. Tides of men's souls and dreams and destiny. Isis, Baal, Dami, Ea, Bina. J. Fortune exemplified the themes of a Libra ascendant by marrying a man she used in her rituals and taking that marriage seriously, although some commented that the husband, Penny Evans, allowed her to do all the talking, but also that she wrote a book called The Esoteric Philosophy of Love and Marriage. Here it is achieving balance between the inner masculine and feminine, and she said that a man and a woman, when doing astral work together, become soulmates as they would have synthesized their anima animus at that level. Her moon is also in Libra, and normally this is the pacifier, the people pleaser, good at settling disputes in marriage and in love or in business contracts. And though it was noted by Israel Regardi that she henpecked her husband in group sessions, 
She probably appeased him as she did not find the relationships very easy. She apparently allowed him to cheat, although it is not known if she also did that. Perhaps that it was at uh, zero degrees of rebirth that meant that she was an ingenue in relationships with such a lot to learn and put into practice. But the search um, in Libra here is always for perfect equilibrium. This degree is also significant because it's one of the four world access points, so it's powerful in its own right, as it represents the equinox, the hours of equal day and night. And even the degree of her sun seems to indicate she came from some lofty goddess realm, perhaps Diana of the Hunt, uh, with that Venus and Sagittarius, having an authority that comes from roaming the wild forests. At 13 degrees of Sagittarius, the, Sa the Sabian symbol for her son reads, Sphinx and pyramids stand, remains of a glorious past. This, remember, is on her south node, and she talked a lot about past lives or being familiar with her past lives. For her to be a sphinx and to revive the worship of Black Isis was a natural position for her to adopt. What I think uh, is unmistakable is that she was one of the Pluto-Neptune conjunction generation. These two planets only come together every 500 years, but early that decade they were dancing together in Gemini. The previous time Pluto and Neptune were together in Gemini was at the beginning of the Renaissance, itself a resurgence and rediscovery of hidden knowledge. Others born in 1890 were, for example, Robert Graves, who wrote The White Goddess, a tribute to the Moonrites in ancient Greece. Uh, it was also known as the Mauve Decade, where symbolist artists incorporated decadent and taboo themes such as demon possession into their work. And the turn of the century madness was a phenomenon where cult-like behavior came to the fore. It was the decade in which Oscar Wilde had his heady rise and fall from grace, and it was the decade in which dark themes of split personality and self-transformation appeared in literature, so it was very appropriate for the conjunction appearing in Gemini, such as the picture of Dorian Gray, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, and of course, at the end of the decade, Bram Stoker's Dracula. We get a sense of his psychic transformation within fortunes and novels written mostly in the 1930s. So to have this conjunction in the mental chart, I think exerts a powerful influence towards the combination of spiritual and therapeutic modalities of any kind, passing across the veils. These profound levels of psychism continued even after the death when her amanuensis, Margaret Lumley Brown, who worked to side fortune while she was still alive, was said to have still been in communication with her to complete unfinished works after her death. This was said partially to have come through automatic writing. Lumley, interestingly, was a fellow Sagittarian born September 7th, 1886. There are no planets in water signs, which is interesting. They are mainly in air, fire and earth signs. So there's a grand trine in air from Jupiter in Aquarius with Pluto Neptune North Node in Gemini and the Ascendant in Libra. This points to her intellectual gifts and the ability to play with ideas with ease. She tried hard to understand feelings, but her primary interest was in psychology, as well known as she became uh, a lay psychiatrist. She made the mind of her, <clears throat> she made the mind her number one subject, but quickly saw that even Freud's delineation of the subconscious, pulling the strings of the conscious mind, was not enough to explain how two minds can converge. So she focused on the Western mystery tradition, but even then, when discussing occult practices, she gave them a psychological flavor by using terms from psychology. Jupiter would give full, full flight to creative ideas in Aquarius in the fifth house, underlining her ability to communicate and join groups. Mars there would give a lot of drive to become the leader of those groups, but also to make her a tad contentious in any group. She was not averse to any dispute and could fight, make the best. Sagittarians have that fiery nature. 
uh, about what was right according to her. One such fight was in the Christian mystic branch of the Theosophical Society around 1930, where the members ganged against her for her insistence on Western practices when they preferred ideas sourced from the Vedas, as per Elena Blavatsky. So she was obliged to branch out on her own, something she often did. Another was a famous fight with Moina Mathers, ousting her from the lodge of the Alpha and Omega of the Stella Matutina, pushing her to found her own group, which was the Society of Inner Light, that's still in existence, by the way. Mathers claimed that Fortune had revealed too many of the inner secrets of the Order, but Fortune said she could not possibly have known since she had not been initiated into that higher grade. She just knew it anyway. So they parted ways. From the point of view of astrology, Mathers and Saturn was at 29 degrees of Libra, exactly on Fortune's Uranus. So the fight was a clash of epic proportions with flashes of heightened electricity, no doubt. Yeah, astrology is a great tool for giving these insights. Fated elements too, I think, were involved as Mathers' north node is close by at two degrees of Scorpio adding to the intensity of that clash. To add to the mix, Fortune's North Node uh, is at 14 degrees of Gemini, is, is conjunct Mothers is Mars at 15 degrees of Gemini. So with both Mars and Jupiter in the fifth house, Aquarius, she had that drive to create, uh, running numerous projects simultaneously with business-like precision, but always insisting on high standards. She loathed idle volunteers who whimsically floated in and out of her group meetings in a, and, and expected equal respect. She sent them packing. And Jupiter probably gave each of her pet projects total lift off. Even an early book of poems she wrote garnered attention and her early novels received reviews in the mainstream press at a time when no one, no one was obliged to pay any attention to her as she was an unknown. She wrote them couched in ordinary romance terms, so almost genre style. So yeah, they are much more than that. But what also lifts these energies towards the creative side are these supportive sex dolls she has from this Sagittarian placement in the third house of communication. Venus, the sun of Sagittarius, are sex doll to Jupiter at nine degrees of Aquarius. And Mercury at 24 of Sagittarius is sex doll to Mars at 21 degrees of Aquarius. So in any war of words with fortune, we might pity the opponents. Fire and air go well together, as air feeds fire. She could proselytize for her unusual ideas with ease. And people said they followed her because, she, not because she imposed her will, but because she had a, an, an authority that people naturally believed. Uh, but she had the skill to put it all into words. The, the most forceful expression of this the martial style of persuasion is contained in psychic self-defense, which is like a manual of the, of the uh, like a kung fu, kung fu jujitsu of the mind. She had a very interesting near-death experience, which is worth going into a little bit. So in her case, Pluto and Neptune are conjunct her north node in the ninth house. So she herself realized her compass point in life, her dharma, was to bring this knowledge of channeling altered states and other realities into the world and to become a vehicle to teach others how to access them. She accepted that messianic role with relish. Pluto and Neptune bring on stranger things, hence the need for psychic protection. So there was an incident when she was but five months old, a near-death experience. She did not remember her NDE personally, but was told it later in life, around the age of 33. On April 6th, 1891, she was declared dead, but a nurse wasn't having it and kept her on her lap overnight, praying for her to live. Apparently, little infant fortune revived, so it was a kind of miracle. What is truly fascinating is the chart for that day shows a powerful grand cross configuration in the sky, all immutable signs. This is a potent, shifting, changing, turbulent energy that could have gone in any direction. She claimed this as a changeling event. She was not the same spirit that popped back into the baby, and some grand swapping of souls was afoot. 
The Pluto Neptune North Node were all still in Gemini opposite the South Node in Sagittarius. There was a triple conjunction of Venus, Jupiter and the Moon in early Pisces opposite Saturn in Virgo. So this could have pointed to an incredible benevolent spirit coming in from somewhere. These planets are all locked tight into a grand into grand cross squares, ramping up this friction or tension. On top of that, Uranus at 29 degrees of Libra is directly opposed to Mercury at 29 of Aquarius. Uranus is the higher octave of Mercury, so again, um, downloaded from the outer realms. Some kind of download is suggested. This formed a T-square in cardinal signs to Chiron, the wounded healer at the apex. All these, all this interlocking of energy suggests something highly unusual is happening. A fight for the healing spirit of the unfortunate to come through. It sounds fanciful, yet when I look at this chart, and I think we should, should not close our minds to the possibility, it could form the second birthday of the unfortunate as an airy sun sign. Less the philosopher in this mode and more the warrior spirit. Although she died at St. Mary's Paddington, her body was taken to be buried in Glastonbury. She lived at Charles Cottage there, which is now a guest house, and was very familiar with the cathedral, the well, the tor, and the surrounding landscape. She had made Glastonbury her territory, not just on the physical level, but activating its Arthurian archetypes. She wrote a book called Avalon of the Heart, in which she identifies three ways to understand Glastonbury. She says it is like a golden thread and the holiest earth in England. Uh, the most obvious confrontation with Glastonbury is the physical land and the tour. And she said none go away as they came from its geographical terrain in the fields of sunset, where one of the best uh, known music festivals takes place. In Fortune's eyes, the, the first way to commune with the spirit of Glastonbury is through history. The second way is through the legends and folk stories. And the third way is the mystical approach through the imagination. She calls this the gateway to the unseen and where the poetry of the soul writes itself at Glastonbury. Glastonbury, she said, had an unending tradition of Druidry that many feel is still alive today, or that's, although that's arguable. She had a vision of a luminous chalice hovering above Glastonbury Tor, and through channeling she devised her style of teaching, which was divided into a similar three branches. The orange ray was the hermetic, uh, and uh, was achieved through intellectual study and magical knowledge. The green ray was through the elemental forces and the interaction with earth magic, and the purple ray is through mystical devotion. This has an esoteric Christian flavor. She talked of the Christ force, and some may not agree that this, this should belong in paganism, as it may not ring true for pagans. But her Christ was not the Christ of the Christians, but an ascended master acting way beyond any historical or even allegorical figure. She herself chose the mystic way, uh, and I look to that Pluto-Neptune conjunction as uh, indicative, and that would keep her in contact with the outer spheres of the universe, most definitely. Fortune nods towards Frederick Bly Bond, who wrote The Gates of Remembrance, and he was a psychic archeologist who did readings at Glastonbury Cathedral. These came through automatic writing where it's alleged he contacted a monk who had messages for him. Uh, he And this is where we get the idea of the mysterious watchers or guardians or validation of that idea. But also there's the story of the Glastonbury Zodiac, which is layered into the land, and where the astrology is said to be embedded across the fields and lanes. Um, I think this was created uh, from a sculptor for people walking these lines, though, it is in itself a quest and a way to connect to the land through astrology. Fortune's house, while she lived there, was at Chalice Orchard, close to the Tor, 
she created an altar in the garden and the revival of interest in and continued fascination people have for Glastonbury is larger than just one person. But Dion Fortune was definitely instrumental in reassessing its importance and in enhancing its mystique. The other uh, intriguing episode in her life was during World War II um, when Fortune worked to protect England from the Nazis. This was not a personal hatred of Hitler and she was the first to say that no nation is completely evil. It was certainly no physical battle where she volunteered to join the army or navy or air force. She did not encourage anyone to take inappropriate action, putting them at risk. These workings were done at the archetypal and imaginal level, performed from armchairs in realms invisible to most people. Yet she worked energetically to activate the Arthurian archetypes in defense of England and use esoteric Christian symbolism uh, with archangels, much in the same way that Blake said that this land of Albion contained the beginning and end of all mysteries. Her own headquarters in London were bombed, leaving just a statue of Jesus, as it happened. These Battle for Britain meetings were actually joint meditations um, and they, they remind me of Lynn McTaggart's The Field Experiments. Um, so we're kind of more familiar with this idea today but then it must have been highly unusual. It was about feeling rather than reason. She sent instructions for people to use visual thought forms of angelic presences armed and clothed ready to guard the coast of Britain not allowing anything to penetrate this force field. Fortune believed that the war had to be won on a psychic plane before it could ever materialize in the physical plane. And September the 15th, 1940 was the turning point of World War II um, when the Battle of Britain occurred. After this time, she said the war was already won, at least at the psychic level. And then she herself began to fade away quickly. So the exertion may have taxed her strength and uh, with all the dead spirit contacts. Uh, it was troublesome too because the propaganda at the time said that they were winning when they were not. So it was a war of information then uh, and that not much has changed. Uh, this is especially resonant today where the perception of who is the enemy has actually changed considerably and it's far more difficult to pinpoint from a time when simple geographical borders were easier to understand. Yet the fight may still have to be fought to prevent an actual physical invasion. Paul Weston's work on this gives the details of fortune struggles and he organised an event in 1986 called War in Heaven on Fortune's birthday, December 6th. He worked on the Glastonbury Kabbalah and has reactivated interest in the young fortune. And he said of her that the Christian and pagan elements can come together um, through these meditations on the tour and that all this is largely because of fortune. So while I'm inclined to think well of Dion Fortune and I enjoy reading her books, I do have some lingering doubts uh, and questions about her that, uh, that she falls under the Sagittarian archetype can have no doubt she was a galloping female centaur, irascible and unstoppable, way ahead of her rivals and able to outwit most of them. But I wonder what she was really up to working at the Tavistock Clinic with its involvement with social conditioning experiments. With the Battle of Britain working, she most likely would have come to the attention of MI5 and the intelligence services, yet I've seen no mention of this in any sources. Perhaps they just thought of her as an, in an innocuous, eccentric, tinkering at, with things she didn't understand. I don't know. I'd like to believe that she was beyond all those machinations of politics, but nevertheless, the question must be asked if she ever acted as an agent. With Crowley, there was a link um, to suggest that he was, at the very least, an occasional spy in exchange for supplies of heroin. He played around on the liminal borderlines at every level, so perhaps Fortune may also have been in that category, or maybe not. I think what, re what remains of my impression of Fortune is of a towering personality who exuded the mental strength to initiate this revival of interest in the old gods, 
and it seemed that she was born to do that. Her work is constantly in print and she can still inspire people to join groups and work, and work in this manner together. Violet Firth's grave can be visited uh, and her own green chalice used to be in a shop window there, I'm not sure if it still is, in Glastonbury. But she has helped to feed this idea that Glastonbury is a place worthy of spiritual pilgrimage, which brings us back to the Jupiter energy we mentioned at the beginning, that um, spiritual pilgrimage is an important way to uplift your energy. This would suggest also that the actions of her followers upon her death to stem the tide of a cult by burning all her letters and papers has probably failed. There is no cult as such, but the tides have shifted in her favour. So once again, thank you very much for listening. And um, if you want to get in touch, use the email, which is eustro at proton protonmail.com. And I hope to hear from you until next time. Have a wonderful Sagittarian season and uh, good luck for the rest of the year. And uh, we've got a lot to look forward to, but I hope everyone's well and uh, good luck to you all. Thank you.